Hello again, my fellow Earthlings. It's me again, the Norwegian artist Knut Andre Vixelan. And today I want to do a short video while I'm sketching or painting a portrait of, of, of sketching a face or painting a face. And it's actually in this uh, painting, which will also be, of course, a bigger painting, uh, a bigger tutorial as it comes along. It will be on my YouTube channel, but in this segment, I want to play um, uh, something from Epicurus, uh, Greek philosophy, from a channel on YouTube, which I really like. I will post, of course, uh, I will post uh, a link to it uh, in description. I'm working on this. It's very interesting to work on this just started up and it was a sketch I had for almost 10 years so it's gonna be fun to see how it evolves and uh, that's what I'm doing and uh, yeah so I hope you enjoy it I think it's very thought-provoking and we're gonna listen to this for like 10 minutes about 10 11 minutes and then I will fuck we'll talk a little bit uh, about this after that about the philosophy of Epicurus and Stoicism you can watch me paint while you listen and you can also check out the main file in the description so I'm just going to put it on and start painting Pleasure is the first good. It is the beginning of every choice and every aversion. It is the absence of pain in the body and of troubles in the soul. Epicurus. In the 3rd century BC, on the Greek island of Samos, a man was born that would become the founder of one of the four main philosophical schools of late antiquity. His name was Epicurus, and he spent his life studying what makes people happy and how to attain this. According to Epicurus, happiness is the main goal in life. We can achieve this by pursuing pleasure and avoiding pain, but also by taming our desires and enjoying the small things. Aside from a collection of fragments, the majority of Epicurus' works are lost. Fortunately, we can find many of his quotes and ideas in the works of other authors like Stobaeus, Philodemus, and Cicero. The reason why Epicurus focused on happiness rather than virtue is because he observed that humans are pleasure-seeking beings by nature. Looking at small children, we can see that they are always aimed at seeking pleasure for themselves. When they grow up, this pleasure-seeking often becomes a bit more refined. We learn, for example, that it's sometimes necessary to undergo pain in order to gain pleasure, and even engaging in activities that may seem altruistic is, ultimately, a way to gain pleasure, be it in the form of status, acceptance, or creating a better community from which we all benefit. The pursuit of pleasure, in the Epicurean sense, is often misunderstood. While some people think that Epicurus was pointing to indulging the senses, like eating luxurious foods, participating in orgies, and being drunk and high all day, this is not what he meant. He recognized that overindulgence may be pleasurable for a short time, but in the long run, it only causes pain, and such amounts that it overshadows the pleasure derived from the activity in the first place. A night of heavy drinking, for example, can be very enjoyable, but the hangover that follows often leaves us in regret, and it isn't uncommon that this experience makes people vow to never drink again. So, this form of overindulgence completely misses the mark and wouldn't have been recommended by Epicurus. So, what did he recommend? Epicurus distinguished different kinds of pleasures and desires. Therefore, he created a system that tells us what pleasures we should and shouldn't pursue. An essential part of this system is the hierarchy of desires. These are natural and necessary desires, natural and non-necessary desires, and vain desires. Living in agreement with nature is the starting point when it comes to attaining happiness. 
pointing to our own human nature as well as the nature around us. Therefore, Epicurus discouraged the pursuit of unnatural pleasures, while going for natural pleasures instead. When we look closer at these distinctions, we'll find out that natural and necessary desires are easy to satisfy. Thus, finding happiness in life is actually pretty easy. Such desires are things like food and shelter. Generally, humans have easy access to these things, as they are basic needs. Another characteristic of these desires is that they have a natural limit. For example, after eating a certain amount of food, we are satisfied. From this mechanism, Epicurus distinguished two types of pleasure, moving pleasure and static pleasure. Moving pleasure is the actual act of eating, for example, and static pleasure is the contentment we feel when we're satisfied. Eating a nice meal can be immensely pleasurable, but according to Epicurus, the absence of needs or wants after one's desires have been satisfied is even better. That's why he saw static pleasures as the best pleasures. Epicurus also emphasized the importance of socializing, believing that friendship is one of the main ingredients for happiness, as opposed to romantic and sexual relationships that often go hand in hand with unhappiness, looking at the jealousy, possessiveness, and the boredom that many couples experience. He practiced what he preached. He was a celibate and lived together with his followers in a place called the Garden of Epicurus, enjoying the simplicity of bread, weak wine, and an occasional pot of cheese. I should add, however, that in the current individualistic societies, friendship seems to be a lot harder to find. Natural and non-necessary desires are a bit harder to satisfy. Examples of this are luxurious food, an expensive car, and recreational travel. Even though we need food, we don't need luxurious food. Generally, a Ferrari isn't necessary to go from point A to point B, and we don't need to travel abroad to enjoy ourselves or to find relaxation. Also, if we crave for luxurious foods, but satisfy our hunger with a simple meal of water and bread, is there any difference afterward when our cravings are gone. Most likely, the contentment we feel that comes from the eradication of desire is the same. Stoic philosopher Seneca wrote several passages on Epicurus, often quoting him to support his own pleas. Epicurus recognized that our sense of poverty and wealth depends on how we define it, as told by Seneca in a quote. There is also this saying of Epicurus, if you shape your life according to nature, you will never be poor. If you do so according to opinion, you will never be rich, for nature's wants are small. The demands of opinion are boundless. End quote. This brings us to the last type of desires, the vain desires. Power, fame and extreme material and financial wealth are difficult to obtain and also impossible to fully satisfy. As opposed to natural desires, vain desires don't have a natural limit. This means that even though we may have an extraordinary amount of power, it will never be enough. We always want more, and we make huge sacrifices, including the murdering of fellow humans, to attain it. Epicurus saw these desires as unnatural, and thus based on opinion. In other words, they are what society makes us think that we need. Especially in today's society, we are told that we are losers when we don't make a certain amount of money and the younger generations grow up with the idea that pursuing status, fame and riches is what life's all about. This means that we're conditioned to spend our time and energy chasing something that's not only unnatural, but also doesn't fulfill us. I quote, We call vain pursuits the types of life that do not tend towards happiness. End quote. Furthermore, by slaving away on the plantation of societal expectations, chasing what never satisfies, we close ourselves off from all the enjoyment that is within our reach. Epicurus probably wouldn't have been surprised why the sales of antidepressants are skyrocketing these days. We simply don't allow ourselves to be happy. Epicurus believed that a happy life equals the absence of anxiety and suffering. This isn't just the pain that comes with the constant wanting and craving for more, but also the fear of death and God. Epicurus viewed these fears as irrational and delivered rational explanations to explain his point. Firstly, the fear of God, which he explains by proposing a thesis that stands strong among atheists to this day. I quote, is God willing to prevent evil 
but not able, then he is not omnipotent. Is he able but not willing, then he is malevolent. Is he both able and willing, then whence cometh evil? Is he neither able nor willing, then why call him God? End quote. Epicurus believed that there is no afterlife, no heaven or hell, and that our universe consists of atoms and void. Because there is no punishment or reward after we die, it's kind of pointless to live well in this life for the sole purpose of enjoying the next. Secondly, there is the fear of death. According to Epicurus, death means annihilation. It does not affect the living, otherwise they wouldn't be alive. And when someone is dead, how can death affect this person? When the body and the consciousness are gone, how is it possible to be harmed? Or from the standpoint of heaven and hell, how is it possible to punish what isn't there? Therefore, Epicurus argued that death isn't bad for neither the living nor the dead. So we shouldn't let the fear of death spoil the possibility to be happy. It's this life today that counts. Moreover, it's important to remind ourselves of the shortness of life and to realize that we might be missing out on pleasure. I quote, We are born once, and there can be no second birth. For all eternity we shall no longer be, but you, although you are not master of tomorrow, are postponing your happiness. We waste away our lives in delaying, and each of us dies without having enjoyed leisure. End quote. To wrap it up, Epicurus created a rational philosophy of pleasure that is strikingly ascetic, opposing to popular belief. Instead of the blatant consumerism of today, he encourages us to be happy with little. This doesn't mean that we shouldn't enjoy unnecessary pleasures from time to time. Even though Epicurus lived on water, bread and olives most of the time, occasionally he deeply enjoyed a slice of cheese. Of course, we all know that the more simple we live, the more we enjoy luxury when we encounter it. The philosophy of Epicurus is quite compatible with atheism, stating that the fear of God is pointless, and that we shouldn't worry about death either. A Stoic would say that we must remember death, because the time to live virtuously is limited. But an Epicurean would say that we shouldn't waste time and opportunities on vain pleasures and irrational fears, so we can be happy. Living in current consumerist societies, we might want to ask ourselves the following question. Why suffer by the constant chase of money, fame and power, when living happily and content is so easily accessible? Thank you for watching. I mean, isn't that amazing that for over 2,000 years ago, a man called Epicurus could hack out these beautiful ideas, which is equally true today that it were back then. It's like modern thinking or modern way of thinking, even atoms and the universe and probably no life after death and nothing to fear uh, is something that that makes it strange to me that there are still religions in the world because it should be so easy to shake it off uh, anyway when we can do 2000 years ago it should be easier today because we are have so much more more information but it also tells a story about how irrational human beings are and uh, when the, now this wasn't really going to be an atheist manifesto for me but the point is that if you look at the different types of heaven that you can see it's always about short bus it's 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 about uh, having pleasure now and uh, or in Christianity is basically giving yourself over to the overlord so you can get some some uh, forgiveness for 
basically be born born human, and uh, it's absurd uh, in its in its uh, uh, in its core. Now Islam is even worse. There you have the virgin thing and pleasure, pleasure, pleasure. To remove all pleasure from life, and you are going to get it in your next life. Uh, it's not a good thing to tell basically children that aren't allowed to look at girls or explore their sexuality or anything. Uh, anyway, but I mean, I, I wish I actually got to know philosophy much, much earlier. I was way more interested in pure science your knowledge and philosophy and it is basically for the last I would say last one and a half year I have started to study uh, stoicism and uh, and stuff like that and it just resonates with me today in a way that I never thought were possible because I've been a basically a pleasure seeker a short buzz seeker all my life but thinking about it now I can see what actually gives me that 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 long-term feeling happy in the long term is always focus it's my painting it is the focus on the on the small things not buying shit not traveling not it's just this this it's so simple it has become in simpler and simpler and simpler it's almost like i if i could just be in a room and paint for the rest of my life which is basically on average 30 years uh, i would be content with it as long as i could work as long as i could do what i love as long as i could think and do that. Of course, I want more than that. Of course, I, 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 I I'm not gonna stop liking girls or, or stop traveling or stop stuff like that. But I, I will never fall into the trap of short buzz again. Um, because short buzz gives you nothing in return. It is only really engaging with yourself on a on a deeper level level. And for me, it's true painting, basically. I hope I will be able to write more and uh, when I find something in a piece. I've been writing diaries for many years, like uh, like they say in, in, uh, in uh, 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 Stoic philosophy, like Marcus Aurelius, stuff like that and actually I think it was the teacher my, my sculpture teacher that got me to start journaling because he said to me that write down your thoughts and I started back in the 90s uh, when I started in art school I started to more actively write down my thoughts and today I can actually see how I evolved from a naive young man young boy, I almost say, to a more reflected, uh, more, uh, I would say more intelligent, a more deeper, more conscientious person. But I have to, I had to fall, I had to fall a few times to come to that point. I mean, if everything just went fine for me all the time I would have learned all the things I've learned about myself so I guess you have to meet you have to have struggles to become a, a conscious person so yeah now brushwork as I said in many of my videos brushwork is the thing that gives me pleasure when I st I'm standing here painting like this this is what gives me 
pleasure. This is real pleasure. I, I love exercise. I love, uh, I love of course, uh, conversation and uh, stuff like that. But this thing, this, this insufficient significant thing, this is what gives me my life meaning, my life purpose. I mean, purpose and meaning is the same thing. And I will recommend listening to audiobooks of Epicurus. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of segments and stuff on you can find on YouTube. I'll also recommend uh, Seneca, which is brilliant. And you have, of course, Marcus Aurelius and some of the other Stoics. And as a painter, when you struggle, if you could stop thinking about, oh, I have to become more famous, oh, I have to earn more money, oh, 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 oh. just try to think like a stoic. It is, it is in memento mori, it is, it is right now which is important. Not, not, not the fame or the stuff that we'll get in the future, it's this, it's this right now that is important. So that was why I want to just play this, this, uh, this uh, clip to you and I will link it in the description as I said and uh, you can go there and you can go to that channel and um, there's a lot of philosophy a lot of brilliant stuff so with this I hope you give it a thumbs up I hope you leave a comment it's very important that you give my videos a thumbs up because it pushes them into the algorithm my channel has growth problems because it's so many videos on YouTube and my my channel my former channels was hacked, so it's difficult to get back into the algorithm. Uh, so if you wonder about something, you can uh, uh, ask me in the description. If you want my help to become a painter, you can go to Patreon, also link in the description, and you can sign up for a five dollar Patreon niche, and I will help you as good as I can to make you a better painter or artist or stuff like that. So with this, thanks for watching and see you in the next video.